I am Julie Brown. I'm the Raptor Migration and Programs Director at Humana, and we are excited today to welcome back uh, Bill Clark, Raptor expert who has presented many times for us before um, during our for our Lunch and Learn series. And today he's going to be talking about a species that doesn't always get the love and appreciation that some other raptors may get, um, turkey vultures. And if you're not a huge fan, I guarantee that after hearing Bill's talk, you're going to, you you will be, and you'll be learning new things about them. Um, it's too bad that we are not um, scheduling this talk on September 7th, which is Vulture uh, Appreciation or Awareness Day. But um, any day in my book is, is a good day to talk about vultures. And I'm going to be facilitating things today along with Jess Cosentino. He is a new addition to the Humana board and our marketing committee chair. And if you're a hawk watcher, uh, you may have met Jess in your travels. Um, he's spent time counting at Hawk Ridge and Whitefish Point and Veracruz, to name a few. And um, Josh Haas, who usually runs Lunch and Learns with me, he's cycled off the board, the Humana board this year. And so Jess is going to be facilitating things with me uh, this year. So welcome, Jess. Um, and just a couple things before we get started. This talk is being recorded as usual. Um, we're also live streaming on our Facebook page. So you can view um, any of our Lunch and Learn programs on our Facebook page right afterwards or on our website. Um, you can scroll down to our What's New section of our homepage, and we have all our past Lunch and Learns there. Um, if you need to adjust your screen, your display on your screen, you can do that by clicking the three dots in the up top right corner, but most of you are probably Zoom pros by now. We've been doing this a while. Um, we have disabled the audio and video for everybody um, and found that that's the best way to reduce distractions during the talks. Um, even though you're muted, we, we always really love engaging with you. So um, we encourage you to use the chat to ask questions and make comments. Um, Jess is going to be reading Bill's, uh, que any questions you have, he'll be reading those to Bill at the end of the program. And we really enjoy hearing where you're coming from. Um, so tell us where you're tuning in from in the chat. Feel free to type in uh, what Hawkwatch you, you normally go to if you have one nearby. Um, and if you don't already receive Hamana's e-newsletter, which goes out usually once or twice a month, um, you can add your email address and your name to the chat and I will add you. And that's just a great way of staying informed about Humana news and upcoming events. Um, this coming month, for instance, we have, uh, we're in the midst of winter raptor survey season. So we're always um, directing people to our website and encouraging them to start new routes. And um, we have uh, we're de currently developing a new Humana app for data entry in the field. That's that's new news that we'll be um, promoting or talking about in the coming month. Um, we'll also be announcing a tour to Montana to um, observe the Golden Eagle migration in October. Uh, and we have an exciting conference coming up in November uh, that we're very excited about. So e -news, the e-newsletter is a great way to get all those updates. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Jess to introduce Bill. Uh, thanks, Julie. Um, so Bill Clark is a photographer, author, researcher, and lecturer, and has over 50 years experience working with birds of prey, uh, including five years as director of NFW's Raptor Information Center. He has published numerous articles on raptor subjects, has traveled extensively worldwide studying, observing, and photographing raptors, and regularly lead, led raptor and birding tours and workshops, both home and abroad, with Raptors, which is now being run by his colleague, Sergio Sepke. He has been living in the Rio Grande Valley since 2002 and regularly teaches evening and weekend um, courses on raptor field identification and biology and frequently presents lectures on raptor subjects. Bill has written a raptor field guide for Europe, 
another for Mexico and Central America, and yet another for Africa. He is a co-author of the Photographic Guide to North American Raptors and the completely revised Peterson series guide, Hawks. He has ongoing research projects on Harlan's Hawk, Whitetail Hawk, and Harris's Hawk. And with that, I will turn it over to Bill. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Julie, for the nice introduction. And uh, I think uh, you've pretty much covered what we're going to be talking about, which is turkey vultures, a uh, somewhat uh, aligned, misaligned raptor. It's a fascinating scavenger and nature's cleanup crew. In North America, we have uh, two widespread species of vultures, the turkey vulture that I'm going to be talking about, and less widespread, but still pretty widespread, the black vulture. But the majority of this talk is going to be on the turkey vulture. And this is the range of the turkey vulture. The green is where they're present all year, and the yellow is where they're present only during the breeding season in North America, uh, much of the United States. Uh, but notice they do go way down into uh, South America, in you know, offshore islands. And they're migratory in much of North America, as we mentioned. The scientific name is uh, Cathartes aura. Cathartes is from the Greek for mean purifier. Aura probably has a couple of different meanings, possibly. Uh, arm for gold, because of the color of the head of museum specimens. But it could be a Latinized version of a native South American word for vulture. They're also called buzzards or turkey buzzards in English, but this is a misnomer. Buzzard was the common, is the common name of Butio Butio in Europe, which is now called common buzzard. And our forefathers, uh, Europeans who arrived in North America came from the British Isles where there are no vultures, but there are buzzards there. And so they saw turkey vultures flying around and thought they were the buzzards that they saw regularly back in England. And this name stuck, so turkey and black vultures were called buzzards by many people in North America. Uh, unfortunately, uh, buzzard had uh, come to be in, uh, come to be regarded as an, in a negative way because they're scavengers and uh, thought to be somewhat foul because of their carrion eating. But nowadays, people are changing their minds about vultures. And as you can see from this bumper sticker, I love turkey vultures. Hinkley, Ohio has a celebration of the spring arrival of the migratory uh, vultures. Uh, this is actually a novel about the private life of a turkey vulture. And this bluegrass festival has as its uh, logo a turkey vulture playing a banjo. Turkey vultures are used regularly in raptor education programs. Oftentimes, uh, raptor rehabilitators uh, will develop an education program for PR. And actually, there's a, a guide for using raptors, uh, using vultures in uh, these uh, raptor education programs. And uh, here's an example of uh, one uh, such a program using a turkey vulture. And here's another one in Texas. So as as uh, Julie mentioned, there is an International Vulture Day, uh, and this is worldwide. Uh, this is a uh, bearded vulture, which is a, a old world specimen, and of course the condor. So vultures quickly and efficiently remove waste and help to control pests and may even prevent disease outbreaks. So they really are a necessary part of our environment. Our turkey vulture has a bare red head. It has uh, flies with the wings in a dihedral. They has pink legs and the underwings are two-toned with the fly feathers being silver and the, the uh, coverts being dark. They fly usually with their wings in a V or a dihedral, often rocking. Sometimes the wings are not in a V, particularly when they're gliding fast or when there's high wind. Juveniles have dark heads. They don't have red heads and they have a dark beak. Second plumage birds uh, still have a little bit of dark at the tip of the beak, even though they start getting a red head because the beak, the dark beak, slowly grows out like a fingernail. They're called turkey vultures because the adults red head, like the wild turkey. Now, a, a parent of the bird depends on the light conditions. 
So this vulture is in good light. You can see the, the, the dark body, the dark underwing coverts, and the silvery flight feathers. But when there is a white surface below, such as snow or white sand, and the sun is high above, you get a, a reflection and the light areas light up much more. The opposite happens when the, there is a dark substrate below, such as over the wood, or the sun's at a low angle, and you don't get reflection of the uh, light on the underside of the bird, and it appears more dark. But they're all the same bird. Turkey vultures form communal night roosts in trees or in towers in the winter. It's thought to be an information center for finding carrion. So if you're a turkey vulture and you join one of these roosts, and these roosts kind of become common, common knowledge, they follow each other around, and they go there. And so in early in the morning after uh, spending the night there, the, the vultures that know where there's carrion take off purposefully. And others that haven't been able to find anything follow them. At least this is the theory. It has not been verified, however. One of the problems of roosting communally, particularly in a vertical environment, is that the vulture above you may relieve himself during the night. And this guy here really got dumped on. However, vultures regularly bathe every day, so they they bathe this off, and this uh, this uh, defecation doesn't seem to bother the feathers. Turkey vultures are migratory in much of North America, particularly the more northern parts, and the large flocks migrate through the Rio Grande Valley of Texas in spring and autumn, and many go into South America. Uh, these vultures are in a thermal, gaining altitude, it's like being in an elevator. And once they get to that altitude, then they head off in the direction they're going, and they just start gliding without flapping. And uh, they glide to the next thermal, and heading south in the autumn, north in the spring, usually without a single wing beat. And when they reach the next thermal, they go up and uh, again, uh, gain altitude so they can start gliding again. A group of turkey vultures is called a venue. And again, here is a re representation of their migratory path, again, with almost always without flapping. So they rise up in a thermal, glide to the next thermal, rise up, glide to the next thermal, and rise up. And uh, this is this is an illustration out of Paul Curlinger's book, How Birds Migrate. In Veracruz, in Mexico, uh, where well, we have the world's uh, largest count of uh, migrating raptors, uh, turkey vultures are well represented. And uh, there are two count sites, one in a hotel or in the town of Cardale, Hotel de Individual, and the second one is 13 kilometers to the west in a little town called Chichicaxale, where they have built a, uh, a building just for the whole count. The first floor is uh, an office and uh, bookstore and bathrooms. Second floor is for the observers. Third floor is for the counters. And here is uh, some representatives counts from the early 2000s. And we can see with turkey vultures, they go from one and a half to two and a half million turkey vultures counted there on migration. So it is quite a, an abundant bird. Turkey vultures eat carrion almost exclusively and from small to large carcasses. The bare heads are to keep from uh, pathogens uh, getting in the feathers. Uh, they don't have to have strong feet to kill in grass play like other birds like red-tailed hawk because they just eat something that's dead. And here we can see a harpy eagle versus a, a vulture. And you can see the difference in the, the size and the strength and the curvature of the talons. They don't build their nests, but they breed in caves, under thick vegetations and hollow logs, and in abandoned buildings. Uh, this is me many years ago, the nest was under this honeysuckle vine in Virginia. And this is in a building that's actually black vultures, but the turkey vultures nests are the same. Uh, these vultures defecate on their legs to kill pathogens, not to cool off like storks. Uh, they have a feeding hierarchy, uh, the local birds, and so there's an alpha, beta, and gamma, and so the first bird to feed 
especially on a small carcass, is the alpha. And when the alpha gets uh, pretty much fed, uh, there is uh, an area of the crop that, that sticks out beyond the feathers so that the beta and the gamma birds can look at this and see that he's fed. So then they can move over and move him off the carcass and then start feeding himself because he's not going to want to fight uh, since he's already got a full crop. Where I live in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, they grow sugar cane. And before they harvest it, they burn it. And uh, the, when they burn it, it often uh, burns up a lot of critters. And uh, so they're dead on the ground. After they harvest it, uh, they also run over uh, some critters and uh, in, the, in the process of harvesting, but it, and it exposes the whole field. So all of the, the toasties, the, the burned over, and the, the mashies, the ones that are rear, run over are there available. So the turkey vultures come in big numbers to feed on this food source. And the uh, white-tailed hawks and caracaras come in and try to take food from the turkey vultures. Now this is a turkey vulture eating on a dead javelina, a, a big pig. Uh, and uh, this caracara doesn't want this vulture eating first, so he's gonna jump on his back and pound him and finally give up and just say, oh, well, we can eat together. This juvenile was one of three over the years that, uh, that I've captured um, on Balset trees, which is a trap for catching the whitetail hawks because of the study of whitetail hawks going on in the sugarcane fields. And uh, apparently these turkey vultures were trying to get the, uh, the mice and got their feet caught. We can't put bands on their legs. Uh, because uh, they defecate on the legs. And anyhow, uh, patients might ask, I'm going to kill something. They usually find carrion by smell, which is different from black vultures. They're detecting ethyl mercaptan, but they must see the carrion to get to it, even in the forest. The nares, this big hole here is much bigger than other raptors and the olfactory center in the brain are enlarged. Now, their TVs are attracted to leaks in gas pipelines as the same chemical is added to gas to make it detectable. And linemen, uh, when they detect a, a leak from the, the pressure gauges, they can just follow the line and look up in the sky and find the vultures. And when they find the vultures, they know that they're close to the leak. The outer primaries are bent upwards on turkey vultures when they're soaring, and they can be plastic, plastically deformed, the outer two or three. Uh, there's a researcher in England, a, raptor, a vulture researcher, who hung uh, weights from those feathers and deformed them, and he took the, uh, the, 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 the wing uh, segment out and put it in the sunlight, and then he took, uh, did the same thing and left it in a dark room. And uh, in the sunlight, the deformation of the, uh, the curvature of these outer primaries uh, was 10 times quicker to straighten out in the sun than in the dark. Now the spread rig behavior could have other purposes too. It could be for drying or removing parasites but mainly for straightening outer primaries. Now, turkey vultures are unique in that they end up the molt of the primaries with the inner three primaries being new. All of the other, uh, the other uh, birds of prey, other raptors, end up with uh, the molt starting, stopping at the outermost primary. They often bring their wings together under their body in anything called flex. And this is also thought to be to help straighten out that plastic deformation. Jerry Ligori shows a picture of a bird doing that in flight. This TV has a broken wing that did not heal correctly. Now it takes about 10 days for the bones to correct. For, so it probably broke the bone, stayed on the ground and found enough food for a week until it could uh, start flying again albeit with a bent wing. They often squabble in the feeding areas, sometimes viciously. Uh, the black vulture is uh, uh, more southerly, 
yeah, more tropical, uh, but it does overlap with uh, uh, with turkey vulture all through its range. It's overall black, about the same size, but the wings and the tail are shorter, and they have white primary panels. The wings are held only in a slight dihedral, not a strong one like the turkey vulture, and the juveniles have a black head. Uh, black vultures don't have a feeding hierarchy, and they're aggressive to each other, especially ganging up on TVs to, to run them off the carcass. So the black vultures, white legs, short tail, white primary patch, you know, you know, white in the secondaries, wings in a slight dihedral, versus the turkey vulture with the brownish black, pink legs, longer tail, two-tone underwings, wings in a strong dihedral. Now, this is an interesting uh, picture. Uh, this bird has obviously been in a carcass and got red on the head, but uh, Tim McCauley thought it might be a hybrid. It, it isn't it's just a pure black vulture. However, there was a publication in Auk in 1930, 1931 actually, that was meant to be a joke. The uh, McElhaney brothers were the uh, heirs of the Tabasco uh, uh, production in Louisiana. And they were amateur ornithologists at that time, did a lot of collecting and uh, mostly didn't, weren't really watching the birds that much. But they, uh, they played a joke on some of their friends by getting a stuffed black vulture and painting the head red and putting it out in the swamp where these other guys were. The other guys saw it and immediately uh, wrote it up as, and su submitted it to the auk and it was published. And it wasn't until about 10 years ago that this hoax was, uh, was uh, publicized. There are many studies on turkey vultures. They have to be marked with uh, wing tags, patagial tags, uh, one in Pennsylvania, Saskatchewan, Washington, and in California. And the objectives of all these are a little bit different. Uh, but they can't be banded on the legs, but they can be um, patagial marks put on them. So how were they caught? Well, many in Saskatchewan were caught as nestlings in buildings. In Washington state, it was with a cannon net. In Pennsylvania, walk-in trap. And the same in California, the walk-in trap baited with something dead there. And uh, the goals of the study from, from Hawk Mountain uh, were routinely monitor seasonal populations of the New World vultures and to go share information and using the environmental sensor, sentinels. The Central Alberta uh, study uh, placed transmitters on six adults and got summer movements, and some of them went down into Venezuela, where they mixed in with the local birds down there. They, they've also marked uh, over 1,200 nestlings, and uh, this is a uh, uh, this is actually a, an adult. But uh, you can see the potato mark. This is at Smith Point, Texas. So a bird uh, going from Canada down into uh, South America. The Washington study had fewer birds. One of them was seen on an island north of the study area in, uh, in Canada. And uh, here are uh, Satellite uh, markings, satellite trackings of uh, three different birds from that study, Washington study. The P. Plume and his associates in Southern California placed uh, VHF and satellite transmitters on many vultures and lots of potato markers. And uh, there were 3,000 3, operations. Uh, several uh, PhD and MS students uh, published on this. And here is one of those birds with the, with the VHF transmitter and the potassium marker. This uh, composite shows uh, birds from four different uh, studies uh, that were satellite tagged and shows them moving uh, from north to south, California, Washington, uh, Alberta, and uh, Hawk Mountain. A recent study shows that turkey and black vultures have microbes in their intestines that would be toxic to other vertebrates. And this is to help them uh, kill off some of the microbes that are there. And many fewer species of microbes. And this allows them to eat meat that's tainted and other scavengers would, uh, would not be able to eat. 
Now, the bird on the left is an interesting bird. It's a partial albino. And uh, Michael Pierce is the staff photographer for the Wichita, Kansas Eagle newspaper. And he saw this bird and just spent a little bit of time just taking photographs of it. And his editor let him write an article about this bird for the Sunday special. Here is a mostly uh, white turkey vulture. Ed Hinkle uh, had uh, several birds that he studied turkey vultures in, uh, in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and this one has white, white primaries like a black vulture. And this is the bird that I've seen in a sugar cane field with white secondaries. And many years ago, when I was in uh, Veracruz, watching the migration, leading raptor tour, uh, this bird flew over. It's a turkey vulture with a white head. And the date was October the 9th. The year is not important. Uh, two years after uh, that, I got uh, a, uh, a photograph, of a very similar bird from one of the counters there in Veracruz. And he said, have you ever seen anything like this? And it, the, the, his picture was taken on October the 9th, two years after mine. So I sent him my picture and I said, it's probably the same bird. Here is a bird uh, with a white feather sewn in the top of the wing. Probably somebody uh, nursed it back to health and sewed that on so they could recognize their, their, the bird they rescued. Uh, the bird bending lab did not give anybody permission to do that. Here's a partial albino. I'm sorry. Here is a dilute plumage bird or leucism. Lovely. Now, the turkey vultures that are resident in South and Central America have white naps, napes. And so this is a North American bird. So here's in Venezuela, in Brazil, and Costa Rica. And uh, they, all, they all look different from our North American birds. In Spanish, uh, there are many common names for turkey vulture. Uh, the interesting thing uh, is that, uh, that there are so many of them. Sergio Sepki. Writing, writing a raptor field guide for South America, co-authored the chapter in this book on neotropical raptors and its Spanish common names of raptors in Latin America. And they found that many different names for uh, turkey vulture, but they recommended the name that Aura uh, Cabeza Roja, so Aura Redhead. In 1998, the Alia Checklist Committee placed the New World Vultures in with the storks, the stork family, based on seven publications. Now, out of the seven publications, uh, one of them said definitely that vultures weren't storks. And the others have been refuted in the literature. And Carol Griffiths and I sent the AOU uh, Checklist Committee a memo listing the papers that rebutted six of the seven papers. And again, the seventh had not there. Further, we cited recent articles that one questioned the placing with, with the storks and actually placed them with other falconiforms or both. And uh, the AOU Texas Committee, after reviewing what we sent to them uh, in 2007, elevated, uh, separated the vultures from the storks and then recently elevated them to the order status, cathartiformes. So they're even more unique. So again, they they illustrated uh, they they left them as raptors. Now the new world vultures are not similar to the old world vultures. The old world vultures are in with the hawks, eagles, and uh, kites, etc., like the griffin vulture. Zone tail hawk. Now is the zone tail hawk a mimic of the turkey vulture? And my answer is a resounding yes. And I wrote an article for a birding magazine on why that was. And uh, so conditions for mimicry are the mimic must occur less commonly than the model. And zone tails are much more less common than turkey vultures. And the range of the mimic must be entirely within that of the model. And that's satisfied too. And the mimic must associate with the model, which is an interesting thing. But this has been observed on many occasions where the zone tails will mix in with a flock of turkey vultures. Furthermore, uh, zone tail hawks only occur as black birds. And no other butio is, just has a black morph, and not a dark morph, but a black morph, so that, that they look like turkey vultures. So if this, these guys ended up 
having a light morph, they wouldn't look like a turkey vulture and they probably wouldn't make it. And again, um, they have a pale panel on the upper wing, just like turkey vultures. And so uh, that. Now again, turkey vultures uh, family is new world. It's been elevated to the order of cathartiformes. We have seven vultures in that uh, order, uh, three of which in white there are in the same genus, and those all smell. The black vulture, king vulture, and the two condors don't smell. They cannot smell. And uh, so here's one of those ones that smell, the lesser yellow-headed vulture. And uh, here we can see that it's, it's quite similar to the turkey vulture. It's also called the savannah vulture. It's a neotropical species in more open country, and uh, but a little bit different. Uh, you can see them, the wet savannas. It's got a multicolored head, and uh, they have a sense of smell. And uh, the plumage is more black. Wingtips extend way beyond the tail tip, and they have white rays in the upper primaries. The juveniles are quite different uh, from turkey vultures and uh, mostly dark overall with a gray face and wingtips. There's a third species in there, a much larger bird, the greater yellow-headed vulture, that occurs only in the Amazon rainforest. And uh, But again, it has a sense of smell, and uh, the primaries are darker on this. Here is Sergio, now, and uh, he is working with uh, Freddie Palinger, a Brazilian uh, raptor artist, and these are the heads of the, the three different uh, species of cathartic. Anyhow, uh, that's uh, pretty much all I have to say, which is quite a bit about this uh, bird that has uh, been uh, unloved and uh, definitely needs more love. And I actually uh, find it really interesting just to watch them fly because they, they fly so well. And uh, so thanks for your attention. And I'll take any questions. Thanks so much, Bill. That was wonderful. I never knew that um, there were some vultures that can't smell. I thought that was a vulture trait. So that was really interesting. Um, and I will, I'll turn things over to Jess to see if any questions are coming in the chat i see a couple yeah um okay um start with the first couple that are coming through uh someone asked um do they do genetic testing to determine what family or order the turkey vulture belongs to uh, i think i think i think the the decision was 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 based on uh, dna phylogenies to make them an order yes they're distinct enough. Go back okay. far enough. Uh, another another question is, uh, what is the white mange looking area on the face of a lot of the eastern turkey vultures? Actually, uh, there are white spots. They're kind of ward like, and they occur more commonly on the western turkey vultures than eastern North American turkey vultures. talking about the, the white spots on the face. Um, someone just asked, uh, can you say something more about the microbiome of the turkey vulture? Um, are they archaea, for instance? Uh, mm -hmm. can, you point, can you point this person towards um, publications or yeah, other publications? Well, I don't have that publication handy, uh, but uh, no, and I'm not, <laughs> that's not my, uh, my strength. I just read that one article that uh, that uh, that mentioned that uh, that, you know, that that I that it that I summarized. Sorry, <laughs> you uh, can. Uh, why don't uh, they Google it? That's what I do. Yeah. Um, someone else asked, uh, "How do they find food if they can't smell?" They do smell. Oh. Uh, there are other ways of finding food besides smelling, and that is watching other raptors, other scavengers, and uh, so they can uh, they can watch other flocks of vultures or condors or other scavengers. Uh, 
uh, and find food. Sometimes, if, uh, if it, you know, if there's a kill of a, of a lion, a mountain lion, or a bobcat, or something like that. Um. All right. Let's see. Uh, someone just asked. Um, they wanted to respectfully question the lecturer's view that turkey vultures do not nest in trees, uh, saying they've watched turkey vultures nest in 100 plus foot conifers in a Michigan suburb. Uh, condors nest in trees, but I doubt that turkey vultures would. Well, I guess anything's possible, uh, but uh, that that does in, within the nest of an old uh, of another raptor, you know that that uh, that seems to be outside the ken, outside <laughs> the the general knowledge. Um, someone else just commented and said, at the Lindsay Center in California, there is a beloved turkey vulture older than forty years. Um, anything you could say about their longevity? Ooh, well, I haven't really studied it since they they don't band it. Uh, that's probably a, a longevity record. Uh, it's not too inconsistent with the uh, birds of that size. Uh, I think we're getting some red tails that are getting up to that close, and certainly bald eagles can live longer than that. Um, someone just said um, they've heard handlers of turkey vultures comment on their sweet personalities. Have you noticed any difference uh, while banding? Um, no, when you're banning them, the, they don't exert their personality except maybe to bite. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, you, they're they're usually very docile uh, once you once you get a hold of them. And uh, uh, one time when I did uh, uh, catch uh, an adult, uh, it started uh, uh, vomiting. It started erping. You know, it started, its head started moving and all of the stuff from under the stomach started coming up. And then it would throw its head to throw this, this vile smelling stuff around. And the clothes I was wearing that day, I had to, uh, had to throw away. They were just too smelly. Um, someone just asked uh, if turkey vultures, I'm assuming turkey vultures, but do they keep the same mate? Uh, I don't think we have any uh, uh, data on that. They probably do, unless the mate dies, then they'll replace it, just like the other raptors. But, and, don't, uh, but we don't really have any data on that, any studies done on that. And um, were turkey vultures impacted by DDT? Someone is curious to know. Uh, probably not. Um, someone asked another question. Uh, are there reports of high lead levels in uh, turkey vultures? There should be uh, because of what they feed on. And... Uh because uh, certainly it, it, it's affected the condors. Uh, but right now, I think uh, most of the studies indicate that, that they're not susceptible to uh, the high lead, le lead levels or they're being more selective and they're not picking up the lead level. But I don't know that any of these studies has really focused on, on lead levels in turkey vultures. Another person had asked, uh, what is known about family relationships, uh, specifically how long young stay with parents and whether young migrate with parents and whether mates migrate together? Again, I think that there's really a paucity of information. Certainly the, the juveniles will, will disperse uh, once they leave the, the natal area and leave their parents and they, 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 do, they do not migrate with them. Uh, some indication that there's a difference in timing between the juveniles and the adults. Uh, someone had asked, uh, you mentioned they bathe daily. Does this include dirt bathing uh, when there is no water available? 
interesting. I, I don't know the answer to that question. I've just read that that uh, in some people watching studies, watching them have mentioned that they seek out uh, water and, and uh, do a rather thorough bath. I wouldn't be surprised though if they dust bathe. Someone commented, uh, they've, they've received reports of vultures bringing food to injured non-flighted vultures. Uh, any information on this? <laughs> Ooh, no, I don't think I've ever seen or read anything about any altruism or you know, anything like that. Hmm. Uh, do black vultures displace turkey vultures or do they coexist uh, without conflict? Uh, there definitely is conflict. And uh, if it's a big carcass, the black vultures will gang up as a group and displace the turkey vultures. And the turkey vultures don't, don't do that. Uh, there was a group out of uh, Virginia Tech that uh, had a bunch of captive vultures of both species. And uh, they uh, I saw some of their reports, uh, some of their uh, findings at the, the Raptor Research meetings. And it was fascinating to, to see the differences, uh, to see the differences between the two. And they had photographed it. Um, can can they carry prey in their talons while flying? Uh, I've never seen it. Uh, they can carry small stuff in the beak. I've certainly seen turkey vultures with uh, with small rodents and things like that, some all dead things, particularly at the sugar cane fields. But I've never seen them carry anything in their feet. Um, someone asked, uh, what do you recommend to do when uh, they find dead animals on or near roads to protect carrion eaters? Uh, they worry they won't see the food if um, they move it off the road uh, as it becomes less visible. No, move it off the road, <laughs> even if it doesn't uh, get eaten. At least it keeps the bird from being hit by a car. But uh, again, they can smell. If they smell it, uh, they'll start looking more closely. Has there been any shift in the uh, northern range of wintering turkey vultures over the past 10 to 20 years? Uh, I really don't have that data. I suspect there is just because of the climate change, but uh, I don't know that for sure. Um, someone just asked, any any comments uh, on courting behavior? Uh, they had seen it on the ground mostly. I've not observed it. Sorry. <laughs> Do turkey vultures migrate um, on fat reserves since they can't all feed in the numbers that migrate together? I suspect that all of all these turkey vultures, when they get ready to migrate, they build up a fat reserve. But that doesn't mean that they can't stop and, and feed feed up when those reserves are uh, are used up, because they can usually find something to eat anywhere. I think we're caught up just waiting. So many good questions. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, lots, lots of good questions. They Thank are. you very much, everybody. Um, yeah, a, a few people um, in between some of these questions have commented just on the northern range in the winter. Um, so that's definitely a, a um, an interesting topic. Um, and, you know, people reporting that they see them now year round in um, New Brunswick and Southern Ontario. Um, Cranberry Marsh commented that at the Cranberry Marsh Hawk Watch had their biggest year ever um, this fall. So it sounds like they are continuing to push north and breed further north and stay further north um, with milder temperatures. I know we see them pretty often here in New Hampshire in the winter, um, probably more so than we used to. So that's pretty interesting. One thing that, um, thank you. You know, in the in the raptor education that I've done over the years, um, I always put 
turkey vultures in that very long distance category and assumed that that birds here in New England are heading way the heck down into the, you know, southern South America. Um, and I was so um, interested to see the Hawk Mountain data of um, and, and that one of the maps that you showed today showing that they, you know, often just make it to the southeast. I thought that was so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other questions, Jess, that have come in in the last minute or two? There's been so many. Uh, someone had asked if you have the statistic about the range of their smell of the turkey vulture. How far away can they detect uh, carrion? Oh, boy. I don't know. Uh, I think that it's very sensitive. They don't need to have many molecules of that, uh, that chemical to be able to detect it. Um, and uh, so, it, 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 you know, there's a lot of variables there, the wind speed, the wind direction, their height, et cetera. But uh, it's fairly far away. Not close. Mm -hmm. I think when, that... Uh, that was it, Jess? Yeah. Okay. One other question that came in to me as a direct question was... Um, the different um, regional, the regional differences in appearance of some of the turkey vultures you mentioned, are those considered um, separate subspecies? Yes, definitely. Okay. Okay. Um, well, well, Fran and Dennis just commented, um, thanking you saying that they now see turkey vultures in a different light. I think. Good. I think that sums it up well. <laughs> that was so much great info, Bill. You're always a wealth of, of information and we appreciate it so much. Um, I definitely learned a few things. Um, we are, um, next month, we're going to be back for another Lunch and Learn. Um, we're going to hear from Chad Whitgo, who is a senior coordinator avian biologist at Audubon, and he's going to be presenting on Audubon's Migratory Bird Initiative and Bird Migration Explorer programs. Um, that we don't have up on our website yet, but I will get that up soon. Um, it'll also be on our Facebook page and on our, our e-newsletter. Um, so you can register for that event. That's going to be February 21st um, at noon. So thank you um, again, Bill, for taking the time to educate us about turkey vultures today and Thank you to everybody for joining. We really appreciate it. We love engaging with you. Um, and um, thank you for supporting our, our programming. Um, you can always show your support to Havana with a donation that helps um, programs like this and, and all the work that we do. Um, we welcome you to join our kettle and become a member. Um, and you can do that all at Havana.org. And we um, hope to see you again next month. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day.